Hey guys, welcome to another World Audiobooks. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Excited to get into a bit more of the story of the origin of Tarzan. Like I mentioned before, I really like this book. Hope you guys enjoy it. Super excited about the new year. Uh, we got some new things coming up for another World Audiobooks, and I can't wait to share them with you guys. So happy to have you along for the ride. Our, uh, over the holiday, uh, over Christmas, our uh, numbers just really shot up as far as downloads. So I don't know what that means if you guys are telling other people about the podcast or what's going on there. But just want to say thanks for listening. Thanks for sharing the podcast. And uh, now, without further ado, I give you Tarzan. Chapter 3. Life and Death Morning found them but little, if at all refreshed, though it was with a feeling of intense relief that they saw the day dawn. As soon as they had made their meagre breakfast of salt pork, coffee, and biscuit, Clayton commenced work upon their house, for he realized that they could hope of no safety and no peace of mind at night until four strong walls effectually barred the jungle life from them. The task was an arduous one, and required the better part of a month, though he built but one small room. He constructed his cabin of small logs about six inches in diameter, stopping the chinks with clay which he found at the depth of a few feet beneath the surface soil. At one end he built a fireplace of small stones from the beach. These also he set in clay, and when the house had been entirely completed, he applied a coating of the clay to the entire outside surface to the thickness of four inches. In the window opening, he set small branches about an inch in diameter, both vertically and horizontally, and so woven that they formed a substantial grating that could withstand the strength of a powerful animal. Thus, they obtained air and proper ventilation without fear of lessening the safety of their cabin. The A-shaped roof was thatched with small branches laid close together, and over these long jungle grass and palm fronds with a final coating of clay. The door he built of pieces of packing boxes, which had held their belongings, nailing one piece upon another, the grain of contiguous layers running transversely, until he had a solid body some three inches thick and of such great strength that they were both moved to laughter as they gazed upon it. Here the greatest difficulty confronted Clayton, for he had no means whereby to hang his massive door now that he had built it. After two days' work, however, he succeeded in fashioning two massive hardwood hinges, and with these he hung the door so that it opened and closed easily. The stuccoing and other final touches were added after they moved into the house, which they had done as soon as the roof was on, piling their boxes before the door at night, and thus having a comparatively safe and comfortable habitation. The building of a bed, chairs, table, and shelves was a relatively easy matter, so that by the end of the second month they were well settled, and but for the constant dread of attack by wild beasts and the ever-growing loneliness, they were not uncomfortable or unhappy. At night, great beasts snarled and roared about their tiny cabin, but so accustomed may one become to oft-repeated noises that soon they paid little attention to them, sleeping soundly the whole night through. Thrice had they caught fleeting glimpses of great man-like figures, like that of the first night, but never at sufficiently close range to know positively whether the half-seen forms were those of a man or brute. The brilliant birds and little monkeys had become accustomed to their new acquaintances, and as they had evidently never seen human beings before they presently, after their first fright had worn off, approached closer and closer, impelled by that strange curiosity which dominates the wild creatures of the forest and the jungle and the plain, so that within the first month several of the birds had gone so far as even to accept morsels of food from the friendly hands of the Claytons. One afternoon, while Clayton was working upon an addition to their cabin, for he contemplated building several more rooms, a number of their grotesque little friends came shrieking and scolding through the trees from the direction of the ridge. Even as they fled, they cast fearful glances back at them, and finally they stopped near Clayton, jabbering excitedly to him, as though to warn him of approaching danger. At last he saw it, the thing the little monkeys so feared, the man-brute, of which the Claytons had caught occasional fleeting glimpses. It was approaching through the jungle in a semi-erect position, now and then placing the backs of his closed fists upon the ground, a great anthropoid ape, and, as it advanced, it emitted deep, guttural growls and an occasional low barking sound. Clayton was at some distance from the cabin, having come to fell a particularly perfect tree for his building operations, grown careless from months of continued safety, during which time he had seen no dangerous animals during the daylight hours. He had left his rifles and revolvers all within the little cabin, and now that he saw the great ape crashing through the underbrush directly toward him, and from a direction which practically cut him off from escape, he felt a vague little shiver play up and down his spine. 
He knew that, armed only with an axe, his chances with this ferocious monster were small indeed. And Alice, oh God, he thought, what will become of Alice? There was yet a slight chance of reaching the cabin. He turned and ran toward it, shouting in alarm to his wife to run in and close the great door in case the ape cut off his retreat. Lady Greystoke had been sitting a little way from the cabin, and when she heard his cry, she looked up to see the ape springing with almost incredible swiftness for so large and awkward an animal in an effort to head off Clayton. With a low cry, she sprang toward the cabin, and as she entered, gave a backward glance, which filled her soul with terror, for the brute had intercepted her husband, who now stood at bay, grasping his axe with both hands, ready to swing it upon the infuriated animal when he should make his final charge. "'Close and bolt the door, Alice!' cried Clayton. I can finish this fellow with my axe. But he knew he was facing a horrible death, and so did she. The ape was a great bull, weighing probably three hundred pounds. His nasty, close-set eyes gleamed hatred from beneath his shaggy brows, while his great canine fangs were barred in a horrid snarl as he paused a moment before his prey. Over the brute's shoulder, Clayton could see the doorway of his cabin, not twenty paces distance, and a great wave of horror and fear swept over him as he saw his young wife emerge, armed with one of his rifles. She had always been afraid of firearms, and would never touch them, but now she rushed toward the ape with the fearlessness of a lioness protecting its young. "'Back, Alice!' shouted Clayton. "'For God's sake, go back!' But she would not heed, and just then the ape charged so that Clayton could say no more. The man swung his axe with all his mighty strength, but the powerful brute seized it with those terrible hands, and tearing it from Clayton's grasp, hurled it far to one side. With an ugly snarl, he closed upon his defenseless victim, but ere his fangs had reached the throat they thirsted for, there was a sharp report, and a bullet entered the ape's back between his shoulders. Throwing Clayton to the ground, the beast turned upon his new enemy. There, before him, stood the terrified girl, vainly trying to fire another bullet into the animal's body but she did not understand the mechanism of the firearm, and the hammer fell futilely upon the empty cartridge. Almost simultaneously, Clayton regained his feet, and without thought of the utter hopelessness of it, he rushed forward to drag the ape from his wife's prostrate form. With little or no effort he succeeded, and the great bulk rolled inertly upon the turf before him. The ape was dead. The bullet had done its work. A hasty examination of his wife revealed no marks upon her, and Clayton decided that the huge brute had died the instant he had sprung toward Alice. Gently, he lifted his wife's still unconscious form, and bore her to the little cabin, but it was fully two hours before she regained consciousness. Her first words filled Clayton with vague apprehension, for some time after regaining her senses, Alice gazed wonderingly about the interior of the little cabin, and then, with a satisfied sigh, she said, "'Oh, John, it is so good to be really home. "'I have had an awful dream, dear. "'I thought we were no longer in London, "'but in some horrible place where great beasts attacked us.' "'There, there, Alice,' he said, stroking her forehead. "'Try to sleep again, and do not worry your head about bad dreams.' "'That night, a little son was born in a tiny cabin "'beside the primeval forest.' while a leopard screamed before the door, and the deep notes of a lion's roar sounded from beyond the ridge. Lady Greystoke never recovered from the shock of the great ape's attack, and, though she lived for a year after her baby was born, she was never again outside the cabin, nor did she ever fully realize that she was not in England. Sometimes she would question Clayton as to the strange noises of the nights, and the absence of servants and friends, and the strange rudeness of the furnishings within her room, but, though he made no effort to deceive her, never could she grasp the meaning of it all. In other ways, she was quite rational, and the joy and happiness she took in the possession of her little son and the constant attentions of her husband made that year a very happy one for her, the happiest of her young life. That it would have been beset by worries and apprehensions had she been in full command of her mental faculties, Clayton well knew, so that while he suffered terribly to see her so, there were times when he was almost glad for her sake that she could not understand. Long since he had given up any hope of rescue except through accident. With unremitting zeal he had worked to beautify the interior of the cabin. Skins of lion and panther covered the floor, cupboards and bookcases lined the walls, odd vases made by his own hand from the clay of the region held beautiful tropical flowers, curtains of grass and bamboo covered the windows. 
and, most arduous task of all, with his meagre assortment of tools, he had fashioned lumber to neatly seal the walls and ceiling and lay a smooth floor within the cabin. That he had been able to turn his hands at all to such unaccustomed labour was a source of mild wonder to him, but he loved the work because it was for her and the tiny life that had come to cheer them, though adding a hundredfold to his responsibilities and to the terribleness of their situation. During the year that followed, Clayton was several times attacked by the great apes, which now seemed to continually infest the vicinity of the cabin, but as he never again ventured outside without both rifle and revolvers, he had little fear of the huge beasts. He had strengthened the window protections and fitted a unique wooden lock to the cabin door, so that when he hunted for game and fruits, as it was constantly necessary for him to do to ensure sustenance, he had no fear that any animal could break into the little home. At first, he shot much of the game from the cabin windows, but toward the end, the animals learned to fear the strange lair from whence issued the terrifying thunder of his rifle. In his leisure, Clayton read, often aloud to his wife, from the store of books which he had brought for their new home. Among these were many for little children, picture books, primers, readers, for they had known that their little child would be old enough for such before they might return to England. At other times, Clayton wrote in his diary, which he had always been accustomed to keep in French, and in which he recorded the details of their strange life. This book he kept locked in a little metal box. A year from the day her little son was born, Lady Alice passed quietly away in the night. So peaceful was her end, that it was hours before Clayton could awake to a realization that his wife was dead. The horror of the situation came to him very slowly, and it is doubtful that he ever fully realized the enormity of his sorrow and the fearful responsibility that had devolved upon him with the care of that wee thing, his son, still a nursing babe. The last entry in his diary was made the morning following her death, and there he recites the sad details in a matter-of-fact way that adds to the pathos of it, for it breathes a tired apathy born of long sorrow and hopelessness, which even this cruel blow could scarcely awake to further suffering. My little son is crying for nourishment. Oh, Alice, Alice, what shall I do? And as John Clayton wrote the last words his hand was destined ever to pen, he dropped his head wearily upon his outstretched arms, where they rested upon the table he had built for her, who lay still and cold in the bed beside him. For a long time, no sound broke the death-like stillness of the jungle midday, save the piteous wailing of the tiny man-child. Chapter 4 The Apes In the forest of the tableland, a mile back from the ocean, was on a rampage of rage among his people. The younger and lighter members of his tribe scampered to the highest branches of the great trees to escape his wrath, risking their lives upon branches that scarce supported their weight rather than face the old Kerchak in one of his fits of uncontrolled anger. The other males scattered in all directions, but not before the infuriated brute had felt the vertebra of one snap between his great foaming jaws. A luckless young female slipped from an insecure hold upon a high branch and came crashing to the ground almost at Kerchak's feet. With a wild scream he was upon her, tearing a great piece from her side with his mighty teeth and striking her viciously upon her head and shoulders with a broken tree limb until her skull was crushed to a jelly. And then he spied Kayla, who, returning from a search for food with her young babe, was ignorant of the state of the mighty male's temper until suddenly the shrill warnings of her fellows caused her to scamper madly for safety. But Kerchak was close upon her, so close he had almost grasped her ankle had she not made a furious leap far into space from one tree to another, a perilous chance which apes seldom if ever take, unless so closely pursued by danger that there is no alternative. She made the leap successfully, but as she grasped the limb of the further tree, the sudden jar loosened the hold of the tiny babe where it clung frantically to her neck, and she saw the little thing hurled, turning, and twisting to the ground thirty feet below. With a low cry of dismay, Kayla rushed headlong to its side, thoughtless now of the danger from Kerchak, but when she gathered the wee, mangled form to her bosom, life had left it. With low moans, she sat cuddling the body to her, nor did Kerchak attempt to molest her. With the death of the babe, his fit of demoniacal rage passed as suddenly as it had seized him. Kerchak was a huge king ape, weighing perhaps three hundred and fifty pounds. His forehead was extremely low and receding, his eyes bloodshot, small and close-set to his coarse, flat nose. 
his ears large and thin, but smaller than most of his kind. His awful temper and his mighty strength made him supreme among the little tribe into which he had been born some twenty years before. Now that he was in his prime, there was no simian in all the mighty forests through which he roved that dared contest his right to rule, nor did the other and larger animals molest him. Only Tantor, the elephant, alone of all the wild savage life, feared him not, and he alone did Kerchak fear. When Tantor trumpeted, the great ape scurried with his fellows high among the trees of the second terrace. The tribe of anthropoids over which Kerchak ruled with an iron hand and bared fangs numbered some six or eight families, each family consisting of an adult male with his females and their young, numbering in all some sixty or seventy apes. Kayla was the youngest mate of a male called Tublot, meaning broken nose, and the child she had seen dashed to death was her first, for she was but nine or ten years old. Notwithstanding her youth, she was large and powerful, a splendid, clean-limbed animal, with a round, high forehead which denoted more intelligence than most of her kind possessed. She also had a great capacity for mother love and mother sorrow. But she was still an ape, a huge, fierce, terrible beast of a species closely allied to the gorilla, yet more intelligent, which, with the strength of their cousin, made her kind the most fearsome of those awe-inspiring progenitors of man. When the tribe saw that Kerchak's rage had ceased, they came slowly down from their arboreal retreats and pursued again the various occupations which he had interrupted. The young played and frolicked among the trees and bushes. Some of the adults lay prone upon the soft mat of dead and decaying vegetation which covered the ground, while others turned over pieces of fallen branches and clods of earth and searched for the small bugs and reptiles which formed a part of their food. Others, again, searched the surrounding trees for fruits, nuts, small birds, and eggs. They had passed an hour or so thus when Kerchak called them together, and, with a word of command to them to follow him, set off toward the sea. They travelled for the most part upon the ground, where it was open, following the path of the great elephants, whose comings and goings break the only roads through those tangled mazes of bush, vine, creeper, and tree. When they walked, it was with a rolling, awkward motion, placing the knuckles of their closed hands upon the ground, and swinging their ungainly bodies forward. But when the way was through the lower trees, they moved more swiftly, swinging from branch to branch with the agility of their smaller cousins, the monkeys. And all the way, Kayla carried her little dead baby hugged closely to her breast. It was shortly after noon when they reached a ridge overlooking the beach, where below them lay the tiny cottage which was Kerchak's girl. He had seen many of his kind go to their deaths before the loud noise made by the little black stick in the hands of the strange white ape who lived in that wonderful lair, and Kerchak had made up his brute mind to own that death-dealing contrivance and to explore the interior of the mysterious den. He wanted, very, very much, to feel his teeth sink into the neck of the queer animal that he had learned to hate and fear, and because of this he came often with his tribe to reconnoiter waiting for a time when the white ape should be off his guard. Of late, they had quit attacking or even showing themselves, for every time they had done so in the past, the little stick had roared out its terrible message of death to some member of the tribe. Today, there was no sign of the man about, and from where they watched, they could see that the cabin door was open. Slowly, cautiously and noiselessly, they crept through the jungle toward the little cabin. There were no growls, no fierce screams of rage, the little black stick had taught them to come quietly, lest they awaken it. On and on they came, until Kerchak himself slunk stealthily to the very door and peered within. Behind him were two males, and then Kayla, closely straining the little dead form to her breast. Inside the den, they saw the strange white ape lying half across the table, his head buried in his arms, and on the bed lay a figure covered by a sailcloth, while from a tiny rustic cradle came the plaintive wailing of a babe. Noiselessly, Kerchak entered, crouching for the charge, and then John Clayton rose with a sudden start and faced them. The sight that met his eyes must have frozen him with horror, for there, within the door, stood three great bull apes, while behind them crowded many more. How many he never knew, for his revolvers were hanging on the far wall beside his rifle, and Kerchak was charging. When the King Ape released the limp form which had been John Clayton, Lord Greystoke, he turned his attention toward the little cradle, but Kayla was there before him, and when he would have grasped the child, she snatched it to herself, and before he could intercept her, she had bolted through the door and taken refuge in a high tree. 
As she took up the little live baby of Alice Clayton, she dropped the dead body of her own into the empty cradle, for the wail of the living had answered the call of universal motherhood within her wild breast which the dead could not still. High among the branches of a mighty tree, she hugged the shrieking infant to her bosom, and soon the instinct that was as dominant in this fierce female as it had been in the breast of his tender and beautiful mother, the instinct of mother love, reached out to the tiny man-child's half-formed understanding, and he became quiet. Then hunger closed the gap between them, and the son of an English lord and an English lady nursed at the breast of Kayla, the great ape. In the meantime, the beasts within the cabin were warily examining the contents of this strange lair. Once satisfied that Clayton was dead, Kerchak turned his attention to the thing which lay upon the bed, covered by a piece of sailcloth. Gingerly, he lifted one corner of the shroud, but when he saw the body of the woman beneath, he, he tore the cloth roughly from her form and seized the still, white throat in his huge, hairy hands. A moment he let his fingers sink deep into the cold flesh, and then, realizing that she was already dead, he turned from her to examine the contents of the room. Nor did he again molest the body of either Lady Alice or Sir John. The rifle hanging upon the wall caught his first attention. It was for this strange, death-dealing thunderstick that he had yearned for months, but now that it was within his grasp, he scarcely had the temerity to seize it. Cautiously, he approached the thing, ready to flee precipitately, should it speak in its deep, roaring tones, as he had heard it speak before, the last words to those of his kind who, through ignorance or rashness, had attacked the wonderful white ape that had borne it. Deep in the beast's intelligence was something which assured him that the thunderstick was only dangerous when in the hands of one who could manipulate it, but yet it was several minutes ere he could bring himself to touch it. Instead, he walked back and forth along the floor before it, turning his head so that never once did his eyes leave the object of his desire. Using his long arms as a man uses crutches, and rolling his huge carcass from side to side with each stride, the great king ape paced to and fro, uttering deep growls, occasionally punctuated with the ear-piercing scream, than which there is no more terrifying noise in all the jungle. Presently, he halted before the rifle. Slowly, he raised a huge hand until it almost touched the shining barrel, only to withdraw it once more and continue his hurried pacing. It was as though the great brute, by this show of fearlessness and through the medium of his wild voice, was endeavouring to bolster up his courage to the point which would permit him to take the rifle in his hand. Again he stopped, and this time succeeded in forcing his reluctant hand to the cold steel, only to snatch it away almost immediately and resume his restless beat. Time after time this strange ceremony was repeated, but on each occasion with increased confidence, until finally the rifle was torn from its hook and lay in the grasp of the great brute. Finding that it harmed him not, Kerchak began to examine it closely. He felt of it from end to end, peered down the black depths of the muzzle, fingered the sights, the breech, the stock, and finally, the trigger. During all these operations, the apes who had entered sat huddled near the door watching their chief, while those outside strained and crowded to catch a glimpse of what transpired within. Suddenly, Kerchak's finger closed upon the trigger. There was a deafening roar in the little room, and the apes at and beyond the door fell over one another in their wild anxiety to escape. Kerchak was equally frightened, so frightened, in fact, that he quite forgot to throw aside the author of that fearful noise, but bolted from the door with it tightly clutched in one hand. As he passed through the opening, the front sight of the rifle caught upon the edge of the inswung door with sufficient force to close it tightly after the fleeing ape. When Kerchak came to a halt a short distance from the cabin and discovered that he still held the rifle, he dropped it as he might have dropped a red-hot iron, nor did he again attempt to recover it. The noise was too much for his brute nerves, but he was now quite convinced that the terrible stick was quite harmless by itself if left alone. It was an hour before the apes could again bring themselves to approach the cabin to continue their investigations, and when they finally did so, they found to their chagrin that the door was closed, and so securely fastened that they could not force it. The cleverly constructed latch which Clayton had made for the door had sprung as Kerchak passed out, nor could the apes find means of ingress through the heavily barred windows. After roaming about the vicinity for a short time, they started back for the deeper forests and the high land from whence they had come. Kayla had not once come to earth with a little adopted babe, but now Kerchak called to her to descend with the rest, and, as there was no note of anger in his voice, she dropped lightly from branch to branch, and joined the others on their homeward march. 
Those of the apes who attempted to examine Kada's strange baby were repulsed with barred fangs and low, menacing growls, accompanied by words of warning from Kayla. When they assured her that they meant the child no harm, she permitted them to come close, but would not allow them to touch her charge. It was as though she knew that her baby was frail and delicate, and feared lest the rough hands of her fellows might injure the little thing. Another thing she did, and which made travelling an onerous trial for her, remembering the death of her own little one, she clung desperately to the new babe with one hand whenever they were upon the march. The other young rode upon their mother's backs, their little arms tightly clasping the hairy necks before them, while their legs were locked beneath their mother's armpits. Not so with Kayla. She held the small form of the little Lord Greystoke tightly to her breast, where the dainty hands clutched the long black hair which covered that portion of her body. She had seen one child fall from her back to a terrible death, and she would take no further chances with this. Alright, that wraps up the episode for this week. Thanks so much for listening, guys. Remember to stay tuned uh, for the episode coming up next week, and subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss the rest of the story. If you enjoy Another World Audiobooks, I'd love to connect with you. You can do that on all the social medias. We're on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Or you can leave a comment on the blog or send me an email, anotherworldaudiobooks at gmail.com. Let me know what you like and don't like. And if there's a book that you just really, really want to hear, uh, go ahead and let me know about it. The worst I can say is no. Thanks again for listening and sharing the podcast with somebody that you know who would love to hear a free audiobook. Talk to you next week.